على رسول الكريم وعلى اله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنه الى يوم الدين all praise due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on his last prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and on all those who follow the path of righteousness until the last day the imam today spoke about what Allah has destined for Muslims in introducing the topic of the destiny of the Muslim Ummah and particularly in, relate, in relationship to the latest uh, series of events which have happened in Kuwait, etc. He started by stating that Allah has commanded us and forbidden us from doing certain things based on wisdom. So the commandments of God, what we know as the Sharia, are not a series of prohibitions and commandments which have no real purpose behind it other than, you know, uh, trying us or testing us and putting us in certain difficulty in our lives. What Allah has commanded has in it benefit for us. And what He has prohibited is harmful to us. And what He has destined for us ultimately is for our benefit. If we are able to take lessons from it, learn, and move on. He pointed out that faith in what is known as Qadr, or fate or destiny, this is one of the pillars of Iman, which if a Muslim rejects in spite of the fact that he may pray, fast, give zakah, hajj, make his hajj, etc. If he rejects, does not accept the qadr, the destiny that Allah has destined the lives of man, the universe, then this takes him outside of Islam. And then he went on to quote a series of verses from the Quran in which Allah points out that whatever good comes to you, it is from Allah. And whatever evil befalls you is a result of what your own hands have wrought your own errors. And he pointed out that the safety, the peace, and the economic well-being is a blessing from Allah for those who command the good and prohibit the evil. But those who do not, it will not last with them. Islam teaches that whatever difficulties, calamities we find in life, as Muslims, it will be a result of our disobedience to the commandments of God. However, in the case of those who disobey God, yet we find them living in luxury and enjoying what appears to be uh, of Allah's 
what we could call uh, plot. Now Allah says in the Quran, they plot and we plot. And Allah is the best of plotters. Of course, when we use the term plot in the case of man, you know, this is, you know, man trying to get over to, to, to successfully do something wrong. In the case of Allah, this is not looked at in the same light. What it is, is that Allah will punish them. But He will allow the punishment to take its own, a, a particular course. That those who choose evil, Allah may give them success in this life, which will confirm to them that the evil choices they have made are the best choices. And so they die in that state and end up in hell. Not that Allah has put them in hell, but, I mean, forced them into hell, but because of their constant choosing of evil, because some people may choose evil and then Allah, you know, puts a calamity on them. And this is a blessing for one who is involved in evil, is sinful, and a calamity befalls them. This is a blessing to wake them up to what they're doing. They can change their path and, inshallah, gain Allah's pleasure. For those who have constantly rejected the good, then Allah makes the path of evil easy and pleasurable for them. So they become so fixed in that path that good loses its meaning to them. Good is for the foolish. And they end up in that state, they die in that state, and go to hell as a basis of it, or as a result of it. And he repeated, you know, this idea throughout his speech that the calamities of the earth have to be looked at as being a result of evil that is being done. You know, it is, it is a tendency today for people to look to the material causes of things. You know, an earthquake took place because, you know, there was a shifting of the plates, you know, the uh, geographical plates which uh, cover the core of the earth. Well, these plates, when they shifted, caused an earthquake. So, you know, those 50,000 people who died in Iran, this was the result of the shifting of the plates. I mean, always they will go back to identify the material causes behind it and ignore the religious instructions which the prophets have brought to us. AIDS, for example. You know, the homosexuals and those involved in this uh, sickness, this plague, they have gone to great lengths to force the church, the Christian church, to say that this is not a punishment from God. So you will find Christian leaders, you know, the Pope, right on down, saying that this is not a curse from God. But, as Muslims, Islam teaches that this is a curse from God. And it is a result of what the people are doing. Because when you look at the statistics of AIDS, you see that it, it, it devastates the countries that are the most promiscuous. I mean, Thailand right now is a big focal point. I mean, they've found, you know, some huge percentage, 30, 40 percentage of the males in Thailand have come in contact with this, uh, the HIV virus. Some huge percentage like this. Why? Because Thailand is, you know, the whorehouse of the world. That is the reality. From the time of, you know, the Vietnam War, when the Americans set this place up as a, you know, R&R &R stop, it became the capital, sin capital of the world. So you have a huge proportion of the society 
you know, are involved in prostitution, pimps, etc. And so, the, I mean, they're expecting that place to explode with AIDS. Now, similarly, when we look at America, we see that the AIDS is, co is concentrated amongst the homosexuals. Sure, there are some people who are not involved in homosexuality or anything, who are getting caught because of blood transfusions, but the majority of people are people who are either homosexuals or those involved in sex outside of marriage. That's it. So when they go to the countries where Islam is the strongest, it, AIDS is coming in there because of course there are corrupt people there too, but it is a minimum. When they give all the countries with all the big statistics, you don't find any Muslim country amongst them. And they have shown, I mean in places like for example in Africa, they've shown the countries where they've made the listings for countries where Islam, most of the people are Muslims, you don't find, you know, the numbers are very small. Where the people are, you know, animists, Christians, etc., the numbers are high. I mean, there's a, there's a direct relationship. And this is one of the signs which have been mentioned in some of the hadiths that, you know, when corruption will spread, that there will appear diseases which were unknown before. The Imam had mentioned this in earlier khutbas. So we as Muslims, when we look at any of the calamities that we face, whether it's in the form of diseases or in the form of, you know, earthquakes, etc., we have to recognize that this is a result of the disobedience of the Ummah, the turning away of the Ummah from obeying the commandments of God. And what we find is that the Prophet Muhammad on two occasions was recorded to have asked Allah to protect his ummah, his nation, from being punished in certain ways. On one occasion he asked for protection from being punished by drowning, as happened in the case of the people of Pharaoh. The plague, or we also say in the time of Noah, time, time of Prophet Noah, where the earth, you know, all the people who were not followers drowned, right? Also by plague, which would be like an example of the AIDS, etc. And by infighting, self-destruction, where the people split up into groups and end up killing themselves. Allah gave him his first two requests in that the Ummah will not be destroyed by drowning or by plague but the third he did not give on another occasion he asked that they not be destroyed in the way of the early nations you know by what they call you know like the case of Lot people where they were destroyed by you know uh, brimstone. brimstone yeah so we call it and in other occasions where they were destroyed by earthquakes, etc. So he asked that they not be destroyed in this fashion. Allah gave him his request. He also asked that they not be destroyed by an external enemy. That an external enemy would come and wipe them out. And he gave him this. But when he asked that they not be destroyed again by infighting, he did not. Right. And this would be the trial. This is the way that Allah punishes the believers. That they would be splitting up into groups when they go away from the path and harm each other. Muslims would be destroying Muslims. And this is what we have seen. When we look through the history of the Muslim nation from the time of the Prophet ﷺ, we see the Muslim nation from various times, various places being destroyed from within. In the case of Spain, for example, where Muslims took Spain and were going into France, taken over the whole area there, the people were liberated, very happy. But when they settled down, their prejudices became or surfaced and they did not divide up 
the country equally. Those people who were coming to fight from North Africa, etc., were given the worst places on the mountain tops and things like this. Whereas those the, of the Arabs who had come from, you know, Arabia and had come across and robbed them, they took the best lands for themselves, their descendants. And so there were jealousies. And they ended up starting haggling and wrangling amongst each other. And then when the Christians finally got some armies together to come back and fight, those who had been given a bum deal, they joined up with the Christians to fight against the rest of the Muslims. And so Muslims were driven out of Spain because other Muslims supported them. Even in the case, for example, of the Sudan, where you had Muhammad Ahmed had defeated you know, the British forces, driven them out of Sudan. His forces were eventually defeated by an army of Egyptians and Sudanese that came back led by British commanders but the vast majority of the people who were fighting were Sudanese and Egyptians, Muslims coming back to fight, kill and destroy an Islamic movement. Similarly, when you go around the world, you know in the case of what has happened to Muslims in various places, we see this pattern repeating itself time and time again. And this is what the Imam is pointing to in the case of Kuwait. Iraq, Iran, I mean what is happening today, the situation that we're, we're in, is because of the people turning away from the teachings of Islam, so then the uh, desires to conquer, to control, to rule these materialistic, uh, destructive desires and emotions when not kept within the fold of Islam, become a means of turning Muslims on Muslims. So he closed off the first part of the khutbah, you know, asking that Allah help us to learn from the lessons that are there in what is happening to us. And that he give us the courage to return to the practices of the religion and in the second part of the khutbah he concentrated on a particular state which exists right now where there are a number of refugees, Kuwaiti refugees, that have come here. He mentioned people, you know, who are millionaires in their own country, are coming here, you know, with hardly the clothes on their back, in a state of utter, you know, desperation and, and degradation. Numbers and numbers of them have come. On BBC, they mentioned that they were driving out in their Mercedes and their, you know, whatever else is driving out but they're driving out with what's on their back and they can only get so far and you end up you know with nothing so there are many many of them who are quite wealthy in their own countries are coming here in, in, in despair and poor dirt poor I mean they said you know that the women didn't even have you know enough to cover themselves in terms of covering their aura of course likely these are women who are not covering their aura there so they run out with whatever they had you know well, not, inshallah, it's not the case of all of them, but, you know, we know that the Kuwaitis have become very loose in the, in the sense of covering. If you watch any Kuwaiti television programs, you see, you know, they don't really cover themselves very, much, very properly, you know. So this is the situation. And so he requested the people to give sadaqah by quoting a hadith where Prophet ﷺ said that, you know, sadaqah blocks 70 different channels through which evil can come upon people. By giving sadaqah, you know, this prevents 70, not that it's preventing all the ways, but 70 different ways, a number of different ways are present, prevented, evil can be prevented from befalling you by sadaqah. So, he encouraged the people to not only give money, but even to bring clothes 
food. I mean, just like when they're gathering for Afghanistan, you know, you talk about anything. Clothes, food, you know, for these uh, poor Kuwaitis that have found themselves in this situation. But of course, you know, the main thing for us to learn is that here are people who, you know, a few moments ago were among the richest people in the world. You know, one of the highest per capita incomes, one of the richest countries in the world, per capita income. These people are now here begging for the basic necessities of life. How the situation can turn. And one has to look back into the country to see what happened to them. I mean, here's a country, for example, that even the very movement which changed this country, what they call the Wahhabi movement, it. In, in the second phase of it, it came out of Kuwait. The Kuwaitis were the ones who helped and, and gave them the support to go and make this movement, this, which changed this society to a large degree. But their society became open, wherein you could find, you could go in hotels, they were serving alcohol, you know. I mean, the corruption was allowed there which should not have been allowed. And so, Allah has punished them. This is the reality. And we should see this as a lesson for us in our own personal lives. And no matter how good things may appear to be going, the situation can change drastically. By Allah's destiny, it can change drastically. So we need to do as many of the things which will ensure Allah's pleasure and give us success in both this life and the next life, inshallah. That's basically the summary of the khutbah. If anybody would like to add any comments, you know, from the khutbah, you know, what happened in the khutbah. I don't know uh, if I missed any points, if you'd like to add anything. Or anybody would like to make any general comments? Comment on the uh, situation uh, in reference to Senator Gupta. Right, not politically. There's a woman right, in the Muslim country. Right. Is there a hadith about that? Is it in the Quran? Where, where does it say that it shouldn't be? No, the hadith is uh, found in the authentic tradition. I think it's either Bukhari or Muslim there. The Prophet you know, um, uh, some, I think, companions or that had mentioned to him that the, uh, the Persians had, had put a woman as a ruler, as their ruler, and he had said that... Oh, they were Muslim? No, they are not Muslim. This is when they were foreign Muslim. Yes, yes. Yeah. He said that a people will not succeed who make a woman their leader, their ruler. This is a general statement. He's talking in reference to uh, non-Muslims, but this goes beyond that and includes Muslims. It's a general statement is made about people in general. So on the basis of that, you know, the Islamic scholarship holds that leadership should not be put in the hands of women. Not that they cannot be in any decision-making positions, but not in the final decision-making positions which will make, you know, which can affect a society, you know, or country, community. So this, uh, this situation is that we're looking at right now in Kuwait and Iraq, what are the um, Islamic implications of it? I keep hearing people mention about Arab this, Arab that, Arab the other. Okay? But this also has deep uh, ramifications from an Islamic perspective. Can you some of your views on what the Islamic perspective of this is? You know, you just did that basically as far as the could be a little bit more specific. Well, you know, as you said, uh, the khutbah basically, you know, covers what the issues are. I mean, when you look into Iraq, you find a country where 
it's not there in name, but the fact is that Islam is oppressed in the country. The or Muslims, those who are sincere about Islam, are oppressed in the country. So you have, you know, a socialist leadership, socialist type leadership, which uses Islam as a cover for convenience. Uh, a mixture of maybe 60% Shiites, 40% Sunnis. A situation which, you know, just Islamically is not, you know, a healthy uh, situation at all. And uh, they just finished bat doing battle with Iran, you know, a Shiite, you know, 80% Shiite country, which didn't have anything to do with Islam. It was merely a, a question of of power, you know, brokerage, you know, struggling of, of political uh, forces. And these forces were supported. You know, it's like you feed a lion, you know, a wild animal, you're feeding him, making him bigger and stronger, and then you're surprised that he's turning around after you've stopped feeding him. But, come and bite you. <laughs> I mean, this is, this, is, this is like this kind of situation. I mean, it's just the inevitable, really. So, this is what? The, the, I mean, a, a dangerous, a monster was created during that war, and it, it's not going to stop until it is, it is to satisfy the sins or destroy it. Yeah, or it is destroyed. Is there a... Uh, and... It is Allah is using it at the same time to punish others, you know, other Muslims, and it is a sign, you know, for others to reflect. Is there an authentic hadith, hadith uh, in relationship to uh, the uh, to uh, not allowing uh, non-Muslims to come on the Arabian Peninsula? Yes. There are said, no, there. I mean, there are two traditions basically. One which says that you know there should not uh, exist or coexist, you know, two religions on the peninsula. Right. It's just, the entire should be, peninsula. Yes. That one is just, in other words, it's just Islam. Islam alone should be here. And then another one, which prior to Prophet death, he had said, you know, to remove the Jews and Christians from the Arabian Peninsula. So they're not supposed to be there. And then the scholars here have quoted that, you know, Bin Baz, Semin, and you know, all the big scholars, they mention it from time to time in their thoughts. See that this is the way it is supposed to be. They're not supposed to be on the Arabian Peninsula at all, including Kuwait, all the other countries, Yemen, Saudi Arabia, they're not supposed to be here at all. I mean, of course, for us, we think we talked about this before, you know, for us, those of us who became Muslims from being here, you know, you could say, well, <laughs> you know, if we, were, if we weren't allowed to come here and find out about Islam, then, you know, what would have happened to us, right? But the reality is that we can't look in that light. Because if this had remained an Islamic uh, peninsula, as the Prophet ﷺ had commanded, and it had truly been Islamic, then it would have supported and helped the development of Islam in the Philippines in such a way that you would find out about it in the Philippines without having to come here. So we can't say, you know, we, the, the reality is that the circumstances allowed and you got here and you found out about Islam, alhamdulillah. But in terms of what should have been and whether there was an error, an error has taken place, yes, an error has taken place. It is a mistake. For situations like this, I know I'm asking a lot of questions. So don't let me, you know, I have a lot of questions to ask them. <laughs> but um, situations like this, all right, uh, with some of the statements that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has, uh, has made, has he also given remedy when we run across situations like this? Well, 
the you know Imam mentioned the issue of sadaqah. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. This was this was a major. You know, this is a this is one particular. Uh, also, you know, the idea of commanding the good and prohibiting the evil. I mean, this is in both the Quran and in the Sunnah. You know, these are all means of remedying these situations. You know, uh, going back to the Quran and the Sunnah. I mean, these are the fundamental principles that that have to be uh, taken on by the Muslim Ummah to change the situation. And this involves, of course, establishing the correct leadership because the leadership, as the Imam was praying, you know, in terms of the leadership, I mean, that affects the nation. If the leadership is corrupt, if it's not following the principles, then the nation will be affected. So then the nation has to put in as its leaders those who are the most suitable. And the Prophet ﷺ had predicted that among the signs of the last day is that the people would be ruled by the worst among them. The worst of the people would become their rulers. So, I mean, these are among the, the methods you know, which can be you know, used to, to change the situation. But ultimately, I mean, it comes down to the individual, you and I, who are not in a position to change the leadership. You know, not in a position to command the good and prohibit the evil, you know, on a societal level, then, I mean, you really have to come down to yourself and deal with what you can within your own circumstance. What good you can command around you, you command. What evil you can prohibit, you prohibit. You try to improve and do the best that you can within the sphere of influence that you can and encourage others to do the same. And Allah willing, if more and more people do take that approach, eventually that can become a sufficient movement within the society that can change the overall society. What came to this area could it in any way be construed as a jihad? With the situation that it presently exists. And outside of it, going into the precinct with Mecca and Medina. Well, it's a very difficult situation, you know, to, to, to speak on, to analyze, because jihad cannot be in the name of a people or a nation. You, know, you cannot, jihad is to establish Allah's uh, word as the rule on earth or in any given area that you fight in. But that has to be the intent. And as long as that is your intent, Wherever there's a circumstance where you can fight for that intent, then it becomes jihad for you. I mean, people might declare jihad, you know, on a political level, that we're now fighting jihad, but in fact it is not jihad. Because it is, as I said, something for a nation or a tribe or a people. But Allah judges the individual based on his intent. Right? Not necessarily the circumstance that he ends up in. That's why we can say, although in looking at the, the Intifada, or, you know, which is carrying on in Palestine, or the Palestinian liberation struggle, the name under which it is being fought is not Islamic. The movement as a whole is not Islamic, but there are people in there fighting jihad. So, this is what, you know, this is the principle under which, you know, we fought and we work. Lay, can you come back and sit here, please?
one more question. <laughs> it's not uh, pushing things too far. Uh, there was a brother who mentioned to me recently that in situations that seem um, to have a bad uh, foundation from or a bad, uh, seems like it's a no-win situation for the Muslim. Allah can turn the situation around to uh, be something good. Can you give us any example of that history that would relate to that? Something where Muslims were in danger, it seemed like it was uh, imminent destruction for society or for people, or for even Islam in that area, and Allah turned it around into something good. If there's anything like in mind that you can think of historically. Well, nothing comes immediately to mind. I don't know if you want to make her. Huh? Oh, David, yeah. Mm. David, so this is the... Who? Jonah, the Bible. Jonah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Doubt in history. I'm sure there, in this situation, has repeated itself time and time again. Okay, if there are no other questions or comments, then, inshallah, close. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت ونستغفرك ونتوب إليك. We ask Allah to protect us, to help us to return to the religion, to take lessons from whatever trials and calamities that we see befalling others as well as ourselves, and that we continue to seek the knowledge of Islam and to put it into practice in our lives and to call others to the religion of Islam whenever we are given opportunities to do so. Okay, inshallah. I hope to see you all next week. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. 17 August 1990, Juma. It is considered incorrect to speculate or to try to identify this tree. You know, some people will want to say it was opium, the opium tree. Some people want to say that this tree was symbolic of sex. This is what they commonly do in Christianity, you know. However, in Islam, the tree was not identified. And we have no authority to do so. Because this is how we approach the interpretation of the Qur'an in that we do not freely interpret the Qur'an with our minds without having foundation in other texts of the Qur'an or in the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad himself. Because it is the free interpretation without reliance on the context of the Qur'an and the Sunnah which is the basis of deviation which took place in the earlier messages sent to the prophets and which has taken place to some degree in the final message of Islam over the centuries that have passed since the time of the Prophet Muhammad So when we approach the interpretation, we first approach it from a point of view of, the, of a contextual interpretation. Within the context of the Qur'an, we take the verses and we look at them within the context of the Qur'an. So where, for example, Allah says in the Qur'an that He commanded the angels to bow, and all of them bowed except for Iblis. Now, this verse occurs in a number of places in the Qur'an. And some people, taking this verse by itself, have concluded that Iblis was an angel who disobeyed Allah. Because in English, 
if you say the angels were commanded to bow and they all bowed except Iblis, there is an implication there that Iblis was an angel. However, within the context of the Qur'an, you have another verse of the Qur'an wherein Allah says that Iblis min al jinn He was from among the jinn. And when Allah questions Iblis elsewhere in the Qur'an as to why he didn't bow, he said, because I am superior to Adam. I'm better than him. You made me from fire and you made him from clay. And Allah says in the Qur'an that he created the jinn from fire. So, by taking the other verses, we are now getting a clearer picture as to who Iblis was. But by taking just those set of verses which refer to him within the context of the angels, you could be misguided. And people have taken that and gone into huge interpretations. But the Islamic approach is that you have to look at it within the context of the Qur'an. And then you must look at it within the context of the Sunnah. Because, you know, Allah says in the Qur'an, وَأَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الذِّكْرَ لِتُبَيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ مَا نُزِّلَ إِلَيْهِمْ To Prophet Muhammad he said, We have revealed to you the reminder of the Qur'an, in order that you may re- explain to the people that which was revealed for them. So the Qur'an was revealed for the benefit of the people. But it was for the, the Prophet Muhammad to explain to the people that which was revealed for them. It was his duty. So, we have to look then in the Sunnah to find out what did the Prophet Muhammad have to say in, in this regard. And we find that he says that Allah uh, created uh, the angels from light and the jinn from fire and man from clay. Because, why it was necessary to go here? Because some people might argue, well, you know, where Allah says in the Qur'an that Iblis was of the jinn, it may mean that really the angels and the jinn were made from fire. And that the disobedient angels are called the jinn. You understand? So I'm saying, again, if a person is just going according to their mind, right? If you have a preconceived idea, because in Christianity they teach that uh, Satan was a fallen angel. So now if you have this preconceived idea, now you're wanting to try to find, you know, an interpretation for it within the Quran, you can manipulate the verses to support this. This is why I say you must go to the Sunnah. Because in the Sunnah, Prophet ﷺ ends that. Finish. He said the angels were made from light and the jinn from fire. So they were made of two different origins. So therefore one cannot argue that Iblis was originally an angel and by his disobedience he became of the jinn. No. He was a different from a different origin of creation than the angels. He was a jinn from the beginning. Okay? So this is the Islamic approach. You know, furthermore, you know, we look in our interpretations for understanding of the Qur'an, we also look to what the companions of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu have said concerning the circumstances under which the verses were revealed. Because if again we look into the Qur'an, and we look at the verses concerning, um, uh, we say the verses concerning fornication. We have two verses. One verse wherein it says that, you know, if a woman commits fornication, that she should be locked in her home until Allah has decided in her case. And then another verse we see where Allah says that if a male or female commit fornication, they should be lashed 100 lashes. Okay? Actually, the term used in Arabic includes both fornication and adultery. So, one may argue, using the mind alone, that the punishment for adultery is a hundred lashes. 
Or one may also say that maybe in the early stages of Islam, the punishment was 100 lashes, but then later on it was lightened, right? You know, as Prophet Jesus came and some of the punishments which were there in Mosaic law were reduced. You know, some of the, 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 the strictness of the law was reviewed, reduced, as happened in the case of Islam also. For example, in the case of the eating of the camel. Eating of the camel was forbidden for the Jews. But there was a relaxation of that law with the coming of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu And in, in recognition of the earlier law, one who eats camel's meat has to make wudu. And this is only in the case of camel's meat. Okay? So one could argue that. However, when we look into the, the statements of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, they describe, you know, what happened in the time of the Prophet ﷺ when these things occurred. They point out that in the Meccan period, in the early period, when people committed uh, fornication or adultery, this is what they did. They locked them up. They were confined, they confined them to their houses. They described, you know, what happened in the time of the Prophet ﷺ when these things occurred. They point out that in the Meccan period, in the early period, when people committed uh, fornication or adultery, this is what they did. They locked them up. They were confined, they confined them to their houses. Until in, in the uh, middle Medinian period, the law was revealed that they should get 100 lashes. And furthermore, it was also revealed that those who committed adultery, and this is after the Islamic State was established now, those who committed adultery would be stoned to death. And they talked about how Prophet ﷺ stoned certain people to death. So by, by looking to what the Sahaba had to say on this situation, we now get the kind of clarity and understand, you know, how these laws were revealed, the sequence in which they were revealed, and on how to apply them. And again, when we look in terms of interpretation of the Qur'an, the fourth step that we have to go to, because the first step we said is the looking of the Qur'an, translation or interpretation of the Qur'an within its context, that is, interpretation of Qur'an by Qur'an. Then the second step was, then the third stage was interpretation of the Qur'an by the statements of the companions. And the first, fourth stage is interpretation of the Qur'an according to the Arabic language as it was understood in the time of the Prophet Muhammad and his companions. Because again, when we go back to the Arabic, you see, concerning the phrase that Allah told the angels to bow, and all of them bowed except Iblis. Although in English, this may imply that Iblis was an angel, in Arabic it is not inconceivable to say all of the uh, children in the room sat down except the teacher. That does not imply in Arabic that the teacher was a child. All of the children in the room sat down except the teacher. Doesn't imply that the teacher was a child. In Arabic. So again, we have to go back into the Arabic to understand the clarity, further clarity of the meaning of the Qur'an. And after understanding these fundamental method of, uh, methods of interpretation, then now we can apply our minds to see how these uh, verses of the Qur'an relate to us. This is the correct methodology. So when we come to the tree, mentioned by Allah in the garden, we do not have the authority to say anything about that tree beyond the fact that Allah forbade Adam and Eve to eat from the tree. That's it. 
because there is nothing else in the Quran to clarify what kind of tree it was. There's nothing in the Sunnah to clarify what tree it was. There's nothing from the statements of the companions, nor in Arabic, to identify what kind of tree it was. Therefore, we are not allowed to make any statements concerning the type of tree. We might imagine in our minds what type of tree it might be. And there is no sin or nothing wrong in doing that because it is human nature to want to imagine. But we keep it to ourselves. We keep it to ourselves. So, the point is that Allah put Adam and Eve in the paradise after creating them from clay and forbade them from eating from this tree. When they ate from the tree, they, they, they caused their state to change. And Allah removed them from paradise and put them within the state of this world that we are all born in, wherein we have to undergo certain uh, difficulties, etc., of life in this existence. Now, the message in the story in relationship to punishment and sin is that Allah will punish us when we disobey His law. That is the fundamental message. Allah will punish us when we disobey His law. We will remain in a state of goodness and bliss until we disobey His law. The story goes on that when Adam and Eve left paradise, or were cast out of paradise, Allah taught them words of repentance. He gave them an, an, an avenue by which they could atone for the wrong that they did. And they turned to Him in repentance, and prayed to Him in repentance, and Allah accepted their repentance. So, the sin was removed. They were not, or no longer, held to account for that sin. So the sin could not be passed on generation after generation. And the message in that is that when we sin, if we turn to Allah, and we can turn to Allah, we do not have to turn to others, others besides Allah, but we can turn directly to Allah, and if we turn directly to Allah in repentance, then Allah will forgive us of our sins. So, this was the you know, essential message concerning the story of Adam and Eve. Of course, there are other points to the story which have to do with how Iblis came, you know, what was Iblis's approach to Adam, how he was able to, to cause Adam to disobey. You know, there are these, but in relative to the khutbah today, he was concentrating on this particular aspect, the aspect of sin leading to punishment from Allah and man's uh, the, the door of repentance which has been opened for man to turn back to God and to be forgiven. And he also mentioned the other prophets as well and their stories, wherein in most cases the stories of the prophets involve prophets sent to people who had gone astray in one way or another. They were called back to the worship of God and obedience to God. They refused and they were destroyed. This is the story of the people of Noah, the people of the Ad, Samud, you know, Bani Israel, this type of things, right? Then he went on to speak about the fact that people turn 
to Allah in times of difficulty. Allah talks about this in the Quran. That you will find the people in the times of difficulty turning to Allah with full sincerity. But as soon as the ease comes, they forget Him. And whatever good comes to them, they look at it as being a result of their own efforts or whatever. This is a natural process, which is occurring around us all the time. However, the believers are those who are described as turning to Allah in both times of difficulty and times of ease. So it is essential for us, if we consider ourselves to be among the believers, to turn to Allah in the times of ease, that we should not be turning to Him only in times of difficulty. Because turning in times of difficulty is, is doesn't require anything. I mean, it is just a natural reaction. When a person feels helpless, they will turn to those who they feel can help them. It's just a natural reaction for us to do that. So, there is no real reward in that sense to turn to Allah in times of difficulty unless we are among those who turn to Him in times of ease. This is when it becomes a source of reward for us. But if we are the, among the hypocrites in those like Pharaoh when the plague you know, came, then he turned back to God, telling Moses, you know, tell God to, you know, take this off us because I believe now and, you know, this, that and the other. This is a time of difficulty. But as soon as the plague was removed, then he was God again. You know, I'm God. No, this is, this was just a trick and, you know, whatever, whatever. So, this is the way of the disbeliever. So the Imam encouraged the people the congregation to turn to Allah in repentance, to learn from the lessons of what is happening around them, what is happening in Kuwait, people who were punished severely, their society destroyed because of their own deviation within the society there, and there's much deviation that took place in Kuwait, where you know alcohol, etc., is you know readily available, prostitution, etc. The Kuwaiti society had crumbled. You say, you say prostitution. Um, when you finish, please know the people who are working Could you give the proof of that? Necessary charge against the Muslim people. Well, brother, I, you know, it's not a question of giving proof. I mean, there is prostitution in Egypt. Okay. And there's prostitution in the there, Sudan. There are people who, who actually see you. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, this is from people who I know who have personally been to Kuwait and spoken about it. You know, about the existence, I mean, the open existence of it, as in other countries. I mean, it is nothing surprising in the sense of, I mean, you find it in other countries, but it becomes uh, surprising when you, I mean, when you consider that a, the most recent Islamic revivalist movement which spread over Arabia began in its final phase there in Kuwait. Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab's followers, you know, led by Abdul Aziz, known as King Abdul Aziz, he had sought refuge in Kuwait when they were, his family was driven out of Arabia. And it is from Kuwait that they came back and re-established you know, Saudi Arabia, on the basis of the revivalist so-called Wahhabi movement. And, you know, the close links that exist. But the reality is that there were doors which were left open in that society, which were not left open here. So although you may find prostitution does exist here, and it does, it is not of the open type. It is in closed and hidden kind of circles. I mean, unless you move in these circles, you would not ever come across it, per se. So, this is the reality of what happened to Kuwait, and this is what happened to Lebanon. 
Lebanon at one point in time, you go back, you know, 20 years, Lebanon was a very thriving, rich, you know, uh, society. I mean, banking, this was the banking center for the Middle East, and you know, I mean, it was really one of the top societies of this area. Very advanced and this type of thing. But the corruption that arose there outdid the corruption which existed in other parts of the world, and Allah, you know, turned loose the forces, you know, around them on them. And they are now in a state of, of degradation, warring, fighting amongst themselves internally. They just can't stop. It's just from one battle to another. Every time they set up peace enough, this one breaks it and they start at it again. You know, killing people is just, you know, a national pastime. Right? This is a result of the state that the country reached. What happened to Kuwait is a result of the state that the country reached there also. And similarly, the Imam was warning that this can happen here also. That the people here, you know, were enjoined to turn to God, ask His forgiveness, and to stand up against whatever corruption, etc., was taking place in this society. You know, because, as you know, Allah says in the Quran that we should fear a fitna, a trial, which will not strike the corrupt alone, but will strike the society as a whole. And that was the um, basic message, you know. And he closed by quoting some verses from the Quran, wherein Allah says, you know, in reference to the disbelieving people, do they feel safe from Allah's punishment, catching them at a time while they're playing or at a time while they're sleeping? I mean, and it's only those who have gone astray who in fact feel safe. Oh, we're safe now. Nothing to worry about. Okay, that was said the basic summary of the khutbah. If anybody would like to comment or on it further or ask any questions. Well, I, I don't really recall what time, exactly what point you came in. That's what he's questioning. And the one we here every week, nobody ever has a question on all of them. Huh? <laughs> well, anyway, I mean, initially the questions, of course, are encouraged to be among those concerning the khutbah. I think the khutbah and the issues of the khutbah are pretty obvious, pretty clear. You know, if you have any general questions you'd like to ask, you know, any questions they have come up with in course of the dawah uh, programs that you... Uh, are involved in, like, say, for example, last night when you had this. I mean, were there any issues that came up in the course of that Dawa program which you all felt you didn't handle, you know, quite the way you wanted to handle it? Was there any point that came up that you had difficulty handling? Or did everything go pretty smoothly? This one question asked, why must the male allow the male for, but for, why, why did the women are not? This is one question raised. Right? So, how did you all handle it? You had difficulty handling it? I think we answered it, but we need, uh, we need your answer. We need more from you. Well, I think, you know, in answering this, 
One, if you're dealing with Christians, you should bring out the fact, of course, that this was not something which was prohibited within the, the historical Christianity. It was prohibited at a certain point in time. I mean, all the way up into the 18th century, you had certain leading figures within the church who had more than one wife. So it was not even something that was universally agreed upon. But this was something introduced because of Greek and Roman influence. Because in Greek and Roman society, it was according to Greek law and Roman law that a man may have only one wife. Right? This was Greco-Roman law. So this is where the prohibition came from. Not from the teachings of Jesus or really from the teachings of the prophets. And then you can bring, you know, the evidence from all the earlier prophets who had how many different wives. Right? So I think for people when you're dealing with Christians, it's good for you to have at least some of those references from the Bible, etc. You can make references, which indicate so and so and so and so. Okay, so we have that as a basis. So if you're going to argue why men can have, it's not really a question of why men can have, why Muslims allow men to have, but why God has allowed men to have. You, just, you try to redirect the question, right? To point to them that Islam is not, is not the one that is allowing it. No, actually Islam has limited it to four. Because in the earlier, with the case of the earlier prophets, there were no limitations. Right? Because you go back to, to Prophet Solomon and um, how many wives did he have? As recorded in the Bible. Okay? So we find that in fact what Islam has done, Islam has limited it. The message of Islam came and limited it down to four now. So really what the question is, if you want to ask, is why did Islam limit it to four? Right? Or, but if you really want to find out about why four wives or why more than one wife in the case of males and not in the case of females, what we should ask, as, you, as I said, you should redirect the question to them to say, why did God allow? Not just Islam, but why did God allow? For, from the teachings of the earlier prophets till the time of Islam. This is what, right? The final message of Islam. Because, of course, we believe that the earlier prophets also taught Islam. So then from there, we can look at a number of different, you know, points. We can look on the point of numbers. There are more ma women than men. I mean, in the Philippines, the ratio is between 3 to 1 and 7 to 1. I mean, I've heard different figures. Women to men. There is a huge surplus of women in the society. So you point out to them very clearly that if you are going to insist that one man marry one woman, then you are, in, you are then saying that a large member of the, the women, a large segment of the women, can only enjoy a male-female relationship in an illicit form as a mistress a girlfriend, a, you know, lover, whatever. This is what you are, you are saying that that is the only women, the men, I mean, this is not biological. There are biological factors, as well as historical factors. Well, biologically, women live longer than men. The fuck? At birth, more boys die in the process of birth than girls under normal circumstances. So you have added to the fact that man is constantly involved in wars. Who are being killed in the wars? Mostly men. Violence in society. When you have violence in society, people are being shot in robberies and this type of thing, most of the people who are dying in these crimes are men. So you have both social as well as biological factors which are causing the number of women to be greater than the number of men. And then, from a sociological point of view, if we say, okay, women can have 
more than one husband. And a woman has four husbands and has a child. Who can say who the husband was? Who the father was, sorry, my dad's right. Who the father was? I mean, it becomes virtually impossible. So, and people, it is the nature of a child. Somebody say, well, so what? It doesn't matter. No, but it is the nature of a child to want to know who my father is. No matter what the circumstances. If you raise a child till the child is 30 years old, and then you tell the child, well, listen, you are adopted. I mean, although that child has been with you, has been looking at you as father all these years, once you tell the child that he was adopted, he wants to know, well, who was my father? This is the nature of the human being to want to know who his biological parents are. So in that type of relationship, you have no way of determining. Whereas in the case of a man has more than one wife, there's no problem. There's no problem in determining who the father is. Okay? And there is something in the very nature of man and woman. Man, Allah created basically to be out there, moving, having to constantly be on the move, providing, building, protecting. This is basically his role, if you take it right down to the bottom. The woman bears the child. Allah could have had the man bearing the child. But he had the woman bear the child. So with the woman bearing the child, she is the one that needs to be at home, protected, looked after. Right? And during these periods, not only of pregnancy, but also of raising the child, breastfeeding, and all these kind of things, the, 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 the greatest uh, focus of her interests and emotions and that's it, are on the child. And so she will have a kind of a link with the child that the man doesn't have. And so her attachment to one tends to be stronger than the male's. You know, because he is that depositing sperm which produces the baby and basically he is on the outside, still functioning, carrying on everything else. I mean, he may, you know, especially in these times where, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on, you know, uh, the man, you know, being with the woman and in terms of her preparing to, uh, you know, uh, give birth, you know, and helping her breathe and all these other kinds of things. There's, you know, there's a lot of this thing in the Western society now to try to involve the man directly in the process of giving birth. Although this is not the history of the world. The history of the world is that the women got together and they handled it. That was the history of the world. See, because in America, you know, this, this desire for equality, you know, the mixing and the blending of roles, it is now drawing the man to the point where, you know, he is directly involved in the process, you know, to, to the point where you have men who are now, when a wife gets pregnant, he starts going through certain symptoms. <laughs> it happens. This has been recorded, you know, medically. He may start to get his swelling in his stomach. I mean, it's all psychological, but it's because of him being drawn into this process, right? I mean, this is how, you know, things have become so blurred and, and twisted, you know, in the West. So, because of this nature that Allah has created with the woman, you know, clinging and linking on to one, whereas the man, in his nature, we find within the societies where monogamy is the law, that they did a survey, for example, in New York, and they, in the survey was done in the, um, it was done in the, in the uh, mail, the people involved in, sell, in, in uh, distributing mail, right, the, the mail uh, post office system, right, they did a survey in there. And they found, you know, that over, well over 50% of those individuals who are married had extramarital relations. 
were having extramaritals or had had. And of the 50% which remained, or is less than, much less than 50%, again, more than 50% of those wanted to. So it, what, it, what you ended up with was a very small minority among them who were inclined to just being with one woman. And this is something historical. From looking at all of the societies around the world, you realize that it, it is something, you see, by our, you know, our social behavior is also related to our biological makeup. This is something wherein or by which you know, Allah has created man and has created woman. Women tend to want to have one boyfriend and men tend to want to have many girlfriends. Why non Muslims are not allowed to enter Mecca? Not allowed to enter Mecca. The purpose of Mecca itself, right? Mecca, you know, representing a sanctuary for the worship of one God. Right? The purpose of that sanctuary, you know, is to provide a place on the earth where all those who hold that particular belief can gather. And that area is protected from uh, any kind of what we could call spiritual um, uh, defilement. Because if we look at the belief in one God as being pure, then the worship of other than the one God is filthy, spiritually. This is why Allah says in the Quran, verily, the pagans are filthy. Not filthy meaning they're physically they're dirty, no, but their belief is filthy. So that is the one sanctuary on the earth where only those who hold that belief may go to protect its purity. And it was chosen specifically because of the fact that it is the place where the first house of worship of Allah on the earth was built. So it is just a question of protecting, you know, spiritual purity. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that, of course. Because people have the choice of presenting Islam on the outside and disbelieving on the inside. This is their option that they can always do. But at least on a basic level, where people, because this is the point of pilgrimage now, where people may come from all over the world and be involved in the same rites of worship of God which was ordained by God to Prophet Adam and re revived by Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, Prophet uh, Abraham, sorry, and revived by Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that in this place people would be all involved in the same thing together, or the vast majority of the people would be involved in it. I mean, because of the spiritual value that is involved, that place has become a sanctuary. I mean, it's like you have hunting which is allowed 
normally around the world, but then people will set aside certain sanctuaries for the animals, for certain animals, to protect them from being totally destroyed. So no hunting is out in these areas. Only those who appreciate the animals who can just go and say what a beautiful animal this is are allowed in there. But those who want to hunt them. As Muslims, we have the duties to convey Islam to others. Could you please uh, give us a general guidelines on how to make it? Are we unfairable to Allah on what we say? Uh, are we allowed to convey our own beliefs outside of Islam? Well, you know, when Prophet Sallam, you know, had told us to convey the message, he had said, Convey the message, even if all you have learned from me is one verse from the Quran. Right? In other words, but that is what you are to convey. That verse. Not your philosophy. Because your philosophy is not the message. I mean, what we are obliged to convey as Muslims learning Islam is the message of Islam and not our philosophies because our philosophies may be wrong may be distorted we are not ourselves sure we may feel very confident about it but we for example we who have you know learned Islam recently who have not gone into the depths of Islamic studies to really understand the intricacies of Islamic thought etc we have to be very careful we have to be very careful in what we say that what we speak of are the things which are well known and, and that which there is no doubt, no argument, etc. about, you know, the clear message of Islam, which is the five pillars of Islam, six pillars of Iman, you know, the basic prohibition and so on so on. These basic things, this is what we deal with. But in terms of the more, what we could say, philosophical aspects, we have to be careful because unless we have gotten ourselves thoroughly grounded in Islamic uh, scholarship, then it is very easy to go astray in expressing what we believe to be Islamic philosophical concepts. You know, this is one of the things that, of course, you Muslims particularly have to be very careful of. Because when we come into Islam, we bring with us our pre-Islamic ideas. We can't help it. And Islam doesn't say you can't bring these ideas. You bring it. And you will hold on to these ideas until you find something to correct them. This is our nature. But having these ideas is no sin. But expressing the ideas can be. This is why Prophet ﷺ has said that Allah has removed the sin, you know, or, or the charge of sin from the Ummah for what they think as long as they do not speak about it or act on it. So we may hold thoughts. But as long as we don't speak about it, in other words, convey it to others, or act on it, then we're not held to account. Once we do, then we are. So it's very important, especially in the field of da'wah. It's one thing if we are sitting in a circle, for example, and we want to get clarification. So we're asking questions, you know, is this acceptable economically? Is this idea? You know, I, I have this kind of idea. What do you think? You know, so and so like this. You, you know, in circles where we're talking about circles amongst Muslims. But now when you go in terms of giving da'wah, there are non-Muslims there to get up and start talking these ideas that we may hold and so and so, which, uh, you know, people around us don't agree with and, uh, you know, it's not good. For da'wah, this is very dangerous. It creates confusion for people. And, you know, it can give a distorted picture of Islam, which you may never be able to correct. So it is very important that, you know, we stick with, especially in the case of da'wah particularly, not in the case of study. The study circumstance is different from the da'wah circumstance. In the case of da'wah, we have to stick to 
the basics, which are very clear, you know, and present these basics. In presenting them, you may try to explain them to the people based on examples from their own uh, circumstances, their own lives, and so on, so to help to explain these things to them. But this is what you're explaining. These are the basic concepts. There's a message that I only became aware of once I came here. And I've never read it. But uh, I understand that one time the Sulaq, the Sulaq, was making dua to certain areas where some of the Sahaba had come from. And he was asked to make the dua to the next area of what is now called Saudi Arabia, he refused to do so. In fact, he was referred to as the hands of Shaitan. Should that be liable, I think? And if so, is there anything else for those people to explain what he meant by it? Well, what I understood were that there were references made to the fact that the major trials would come from this region. Yeah. The, I don't know if it's Bukhari Muslim, but it is reliable. You know, there are a couple of reliable narrations in reference to it. I mean, coming from this region, but it's like, for example, the description that Prophet has gave of one of the signs, among the signs of the last day, was that an Ethiopian with skinny legs would tear down the Kaaba. You know, it's like, is this an indictment for Ethiopians? That Muslims now have to be careful about Ethiopians? No. I mean, this is just a reality. Prophet ﷺ stated that this individual would be there tearing down the Kaaba. So we're expecting that some other things to happen. So it would be, you know, we the Kaaba being destroyed. Yes. So the fact that fitna may come from this area doesn't does not in itself mean that the people of this area are a fitna. An individual, a group may come from this area to create fitna. I mean, just as, you know, when Prophet Isa comes, he will be coming in the region of Cham, which is like, you know, Syria, uh, Lebanon, Jordan area, right? You know? But the fact that he is coming from that area doesn't necessarily mean that the people of that area are... Uh, I mean, he will descend in that area. It doesn't mean that the people of that area are themselves uh, saviors of Islam. No. Or pious at that time. Sometimes just can't look at one. Hadith may be a general rule up. Then other hadith explains the detail that could, have, that could clarify what happens a lot of times. A lot of situations. And even about times of the last day, about a fire or something. Just some of the scouts that it's already taking place. So simply because the hadith is there. And you may be looking for something which already taking place. So all these things have to be taken into consideration when you deal with hadith. They're looking at hadith. And every hadith on the subject, in a lot of situations, you bring about clarity of the whole picture to see the gist of what's the meaning of the hadith. If you take just a hadith in general, you can miss out relying on particular hadith that are other hadith around the subject matter, which explain it in detail. Yeah. To share something? Huh? Something? <laughs> Something interesting. Uh, share it. Uh, it is my question because it was raised because uh, 
in Dawa, we cannot help if somebody asks this question regarding this current development. So if we evade uh, answering them directly, say it's political issue like this, uh, etc., I don't think uh, the audience will be satisfied. I mean, what kind of question are you asking? The one we are just discussing right now. It's, uh, now most things have been like this, everything. Including, uh, if I watch the television or uh, newspapers, I don't get much news. I heard that uh, we have to refer to the BBC news. I don't know why this is the case, because uh, in Quran, the truth should be open. We should speak about the truth. If we don't tell the truth, it's an Islamic. If anybody asks this question uh, and we don't answer them directly, I don't think it will be good for us. That's why I raised this question to you. So the question is no, the question is this. What is the direct answer that you can give? This is what the issue is. This is what we're looking at. This is what we're trying to say that this type of a question, the type of answer that you may want to give, this is, if you looked at the situation of there being a Muslim Ummah, then you can give that kind of an answer. But in, in, in reality, I mean, the only thing you can clarify to people is that, you know, what has happened is that this cannot be looked at as a Muslim-Muslim struggle. You can't look at it in that light. If people, people are looking at it. The people said to me, you know, I mean, how it is that Muslims fighting Muslims? I said, well, it's not really an issue of Muslims fighting Muslims. Huh? No, but I'm saying that is not what the issue is. I mean, in, in fact, you found Muslims fighting Muslims. But the issue that is involved here is an issue of political expansion. Iraq is not a Muslim country. It is a country containing Muslims. They're two different things. 